So hello, everybody. Welcome to our EDOT 2023 national panel discussion. Um, my name is Ari. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm your host and tech support for the day. People with eating disorders cannot continue to wait for equitable care. We need to transform our current systems. Our national working committee, made up of community-based eating disorder groups, Body Brave, the Bulimia Anorexia Nervosa Association, Eating Disorders Nova Scotia, the Eating Disorder Support Network of Alberta, Jesse's Legacy, the National Eating Disorder Information Center, the National Initiative for Eating Disorders, Sheena's Place, the Waterloo Wellington Eating Disorder Coalition, and Vancouver Island Voices for Eating Disorders, felt that it'd be important to organize a panel wherein we'd be bringing this message to folks beyond our eating disorder spaces and into mental health spaces. This panel aims to be a solutions-focused conversation, featuring people with a variety of experiences, including people personally living with an eating disorder and other co-occurring intersections of disadvantage, people professionally supporting people with eating disorders across settings like hospitals, community, and schools, and people with systems knowledge in mental health across organizations working at provincial and federal levels. As we embark on this journey of learning and reflection, it's important that we recognize the systemic manner in which some communities on the land colonially known as Canada have been impacted. We recognize that experiences of racism and settler colonialism continue to have intergenerational impacts to this very day, which can lead to many barriers in recognizing, accessing, and receiving support for their mental health, including their eating disorder. The pervasiveness of these impacts are really present in our field, showing up in research studies, treatment protocols, and training methods, which are often geared for folks who are cisgender, heterosexual, upper middle class, and often white, leaving many, especially Black, Indigenous, 2SLGBTQIA+, and neurodivergent communities without sensitive and appropriate care. I wanna name on behalf of everyone on this panel that the effect of these inequities can be seen on who is and isn't represented on the panel, reflecting current power dynamics in many mental health spaces. We need to have many more conversations on top of this one, including many people with living or lived experience with eating disorders as possible and representation from non-Western approaches to health and wellness. Our panelists here tonight recognize these realities and we're hoping that their perspectives will be useful in supplementing your existing knowledge as we work together to prioritize care for people living with eating disorders at provincial and national levels. Finally, as we work to transform the systems that we're in, I want to make one thing clear to everyone who's listening. We are all inherently worthy, regardless of our relationship to health. I don't believe that being healthy or pursuing health is an obligation that an individual owes to society, nor reflective of someone's value. We are all treaty people and recognizing how our relationship with land, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually is interconnected with how people can experience disordered eating is something we all can reflect on. With this in mind, I'm really happy now to introduce our moderator, Chloe. I've personally had the pleasure to share space with Chloe in multiple forums as she shares her recovery experience with an eating disorder and creates community spaces for others who have been personally affected on her blog, on mental health committees, and during workshops at post-secondary institutions across the province of Ontario. It was an intentional decision for the planning committee to have this conversation moderated by someone with a recent personal experience with an eating disorder, and um, we're glad to have Chloe here with us. I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Ari, for the warm welcome. It really is an honor to be here to moderate this important discussion today. And I think what makes this event especially unique is the collaborative cross-sectoral approach. Oftentimes with EDA events, it feels sometimes like we're preaching to the choir and to people who already have an in-depth awareness of eating disorders and of the illness. However, you don't have to be directly impacted by an eating disorder to recognize how serious and prevalent they are. And also to have a moderator um, with lived experience is definitely significant. That said, I recognize that in many ways, I do fit the stereotype of a quote unquote typical ED patient. And even though I face barriers in accessing treatment and care, I have to reflect and consider how much worse it is for others who don't present or look like me. Through my own advocacy work, I aim to hold spaces for all sorts of experiences that differ from my own. I'm in a state of constantly learning and unlearning what it means to be a person with lived experience. 
And finally, I do want to acknowledge that these conversations about eating disorders can be very difficult. And I think by showing up and being here is a tremendous act of courage, commitment, and curiosity. I remember many years ago as a university student, there was an in-person event during EDAW and I was terrified to attend. However, I showed up late, I hovered in the corner and it was through that small step that I realized, wow, you know, I'm not the only one. So it certainly took time to reach a place where I've been able to overcome all of that self-stigma and I'm really honored to be here today. Because eating disorders are mental illnesses that are steeped in so much stigma and secrecy, it's really special to bring together this many people in a brave space. So thank you for being here. And next, I'll be introducing our esteemed panelists. So our first panelist is Shira. Shira is a mental health advocate, educator, and student living in British Columbia. She also lives with mental health conditions, including anorexia, schizophrenia, and borderline personality disorder. Our next panelist is Margaret. Margaret is the CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association. Along with a deep compassion for those facing mental health and addiction issues, she brings with her over 20 years of leadership experience. Next, we have Anita. Anita is a clinical psychologist, and she's also the owner of the Center for Psychology and Emotion Regulation. This is specializing in eating disorders, personality disorders, and trauma. She serves as adjunct faculty position at York University and is a distinguished faculty position at York University. I'm sorry, and is a distinguished fellow for the Academy, Academy for Eating Disorders. Quite a lot of distinguishments there. Sorry, Anita. <laughs> Next, we have Allison. Allison is a psychiatrist and chief and medical director of the mental health program at Trillium Health Partners. She is also board chair of the Canadian Psychiatric Association. She has worked across hospital, community, and academic settings. Dave is an educator for 24 years, and he's worked in private, public, elementary, secondary, and international schools. For the past 10 years, he's worked as a school principal. He's the father of Natalie, who is now 18 and is recovering from her own fight with an eating disorder. He shares their experience with principals across Ontario. Paul resides in Victoria with his wife and is the father of two daughters. Over the course of many years during his youngest daughter's adolescence, he and his wife were fully immersed in supporting their child with her eating disorder, which included working alongside hospital, countless medical personnel, counselors, and educators. Paul has been a registered dietitian since 2009. She provides nutrition counseling services to adults, adolescents, and children, and specializes in eating disorders, disordered eating, behavioral feeding issues, and picky eaters. Cynthia, unfortunately, um, cannot be here with us today. She is recovering from an illness. And finally, we have uh, Karen. Karen is a family physician based in Hamilton, Ontario. Her past clinical experiences include work in remote areas of Northern Ontario and in the Himalayan foothills of North India. Um, she currently works full-time at Body Brave, which is a nonprofit organization focused on providing first-line treatment and support for people with eating disorders. We have a fantastic lineup, and I'm so excited to have all of us here today. I, I want to let everyone know that we'll be engaging in conversation with the panelists until the hour mark. And then we'll be turning it over for an audience Q&A, which will happen through the general chat or you can message Ari directly. The panelists and moder, we have all been asked to speak from an I perspective and to not make any assumptions about others' experiences and to also avoid going into details about trauma or specific eating disorder symptoms, such as numbers. We ask that you please keep these language guidelines in mind while asking questions. All right, so to start us off, um, I'd like to look at the folks with lived and living experience. 
Shira, I'll begin with you. And I'd love to know from your experience, what improvements to care for people with eating disorders would you like to see in the next one, three, and five years? Um, thank you so much for the question. And I'm so excited to be here today speaking on the panel. Um, and um, starting with in improvements for in the next year, I would say um, a really big thing is less barriers to entering treatment and different um, involvement levels possible with treatment. Um, in my experience right now, uh, I've found that there's a lot of barriers to entering an eating disorder recovery program, and there's a limited amount of types of what that program looks like and what's involved there. Um, and I think we need to take more of a harm reduction approach as well and consider that. And these are all things that I believe we could accomplish in the next year is making that um, making recovery more of a space for uh, those approaches. Um, within the next three years, I think a really great step would be to have earlier screening and interventions for eating disorders. Um, I know I didn't start receiving help for my eating disorder until about 10 years after it had begun. And I know that's um, not the most uncommon experience. Um, and it's uh, the earlier the intervention is applied, the better the results will be in my experience. Um, and for me, when I started receiving help, um, it wasn't the type of help I really needed at that point. Um, so I think something else that really goes along with that earlier screening and intervention is um, education for mental health professionals who aren't specialized in eating disorders, because not every mental health professional can be a specialist in eating disorders, but every mental health professional is capable of having um, an understanding of what an eating disorder is and what some basic guidelines of what is helpful or not helpful. Um, because in my experience working with many different me mental health professionals over the years, it's been um, a really stark contrast for the ones who are familiar with eating disorders and the ones who aren't as familiar. Um, and this would include also having alternative treatment options um, and not just one definition of treatment, um, like I said in the one year um, mark. And lastly, for a five year mark, I would say a lot more prevention um, for preventing eating disorders, and especially in children, because um, I know for me, my eating disorder started when I was about seven or eight years old. And I believe that if my school had taken a different approach, uh, things could have turned out differently for me. And so um, there's a lot of research that's really great about taking uh, a whole school approach to promoting mental health. And I would really encourage people to look into that. And that's something I'm really advocating for right now, um, which does require a lot of training and resources and time and knowledge, but it also can have the ability to make a really big impact. Thank you. Thank you for your, your candidness and being so open about your experience. I think that's a great start and so many suggestions that you've brought up right here. Dave, what about you? Uh, what do you foresee for the next one, three, and five years? Well, um, you know, I want to give Shira a big high five because uh, her and I are, are thinking the same language in terms of long-term planning, and I'm sure Paul will probably speak to that a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, first I want to thank for the opportunity just to be here as a dad of of um of somebody who who struggled and we almost lost and also uh, you know going from an emergency room four hours later into a school with uh children around the same age boy did it really hit me that we have to do something here so uh within one year um really seeing more education around uh within within the education system 
and then how we can tie that in with our healthcare professionals. How do we build those bridges and, and make those connections? And that's one of the things we're, we're talking about today. Uh, within three years, uh, just need some more help with resources to provide um, not only parents to arm themselves against social media, but also teachers how to teach kids with social media. A lot of the challenges that we find and, and something that I certainly learned in my daughter's journey is, um, you know, she started following some of these very influential uh, individuals online and it became a safe place for her where a lot of a lot of uh, folks who were struggling with eating disorder or disordered eating were were supporting each other. Um, so how do we have healthy conversations around that and and guide them through those uh, those pathways to come out with healthier outcomes? And then five years, um, I would love it if we could somehow create, you know, mandatory training, even in our in our teachers colleges, so we can have teachers able to identify early uh, within their students uh, signs of disordered eating or eating disorder. And even now, partnerships with um, you know, some of our key healthcare providers, uh, some sort of, of connection that can be made back with the school to help and, and have a conversation with that. And then on a bigger scale, just looking at curriculum, like the language that we use now still, you know, uh, talking about healthy and unhealthy food and, and these kinds of things, instead of framing it like, you know, food is fuel or all food fits. And just taking away that stigma and some of those stereotypes that are still out there. So I know that's a long road ahead, but that, those are some of the big things that I'd like to see change. Thank you, Dave. I'm hearing a, a lot of points being brought up around education. And Paul, I know you're also in a similar position where you're the father of someone with an eating disorder. What about you? What are your hopes for the next one, three, and five years? Well, thank you, Chloe and uh, Shira. Dave, I'm going to just extend the, the high fives. Uh, just remarkable and uh, humble to uh, to join this group. Um, just by way of context, um, you know, in the intervening years since our daughter's first diagnosis uh, as an adolescent uh, with an eating disorder, uh, and the time since we've had my wife and I have had numerous opportunities to talk and share, and, and with our daughter as well, just around the experience. Um, that we have and we continue to have as a family. Um, and, you know, I, I think as I listened to both Shira and Dave, the, the, the big part that was part of our experience and certainly has led to curiosities about the path forward is just around the, the conversations and the challenges and, and, and to some extent the trauma attached to how this plays out in the family dynamic and, and what this lo does this look like uh, for family relationships. And I think if there were an area that we were consistently looking to try to navigate as parents, it was how do we, how do we uh, in addition to all the medical supports, we were at the time in London, Ontario, where we had access to, to incredible supports. Um, but the big piece for us was just how do we navigate this in our home and how do we keep our lines of communication open, recognizing also the, um, the challenges for our daughter and in terms of keeping those lines open and, and, and keeping relationships intact. We had another daughter as well uh, that was, you know, uh, involved in this. So for me, um, in addition to the I think the beautifully eloquent comments from Shira and Dave, it's how do we put, turn a spotlight also uh, to uh, helping families navigate uh, dads, moms, siblings, uh, extended family members, uh, the very real presence of uh, the eating disorder in the home and what that looks like. And, and really it's in, in a one to year, one to three year plan, it's really just how do we uh, engage opportunities for there to be discourse on that and to destigmatize those conversations. As a father, uh, I often found myself as the only dad at, uh, at some of these sessions and it made me curious about what, what seemed to be excluding fathers from this conversation. And, uh, and in the intervening years since then, I've, I've tried to make sure that my voice is involved in this, which is certainly a part of why I'm humbly here today. But I think that particular piece, in addition to all of the uh, supports that we're looking at with respect to medical and uh, uh, you know, physical co uh, conversations around uh, dealing with eating disorder, it's that the social emotional pieces inside the family dynamic.
Thank you, Paul. I can see in the comments that really seems to be resonating with folks that, you know, the eating disorder doesn't exist in the silo. It really touches on anyone that's involved. I, I do want to just take a moment here to pause. And again, thank you three so much for opening. Hearing from folks who've been directly impacted always makes me a bit emotional because I just know how challenging it is to put the words together um, and share. So as we pause, I also want to check to see if any other panelists wanted to elaborate or um, add anything else to this first question. Yeah, Shira, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add, I, I went through that really quickly, I feel like. So I just wanted to add that um, for the whole school approach to promoting mental health, um, it includes including the parents, the students, and all the staff in the community and connecting all those pieces together to help everyone have a better awareness and understanding. And I think with eating disorders, it can really be um, a powerful tool, um, as with any mental health struggles, um, just because it allows for an earlier intervention and it allows for everyone to have a better understanding, like especially like how Paul was saying of how to handle the situation when maybe a mental health struggle such as an eating disorder or disordered eating does arise. Um, because I know in my personal experience, um, when I was struggling um, as a child, I was um, getting a lot of misguided comments from teachers and from my parents about how ungrateful I was and um, things like that. And I know that was really harmful for me in the long run um, in terms of my recovery. Thank you for that point. Language is so, so important. I completely agree. Dave, did I see you had a hand raised as well, just to add something quickly before we move on? Yeah, no, just quickly. And and I'm glad Paul did speak to uh, his experience too. And, and absolutely, I would say that um, when we first my wife and I and, and my daughter went through this. We were lost as well in this big sea. We didn't know where to navigate and where to turn to. Um, and one thing that was really tricky for us is, is my daughter's age was in that gray area where the medical practitioners were faced whether they were going to share that information with us uh, that she had disclosed to them or maintain confidence. Uh, that confidentiality piece. And and some I really wrestled with that because I think, well, if I had known this earlier, I could have done things to help. But I think what it really boils down to, again, is that early intervention piece. So if there's anything that we can do around this uh, is, is, is to really, you know, find ways to intervene soon. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, if there's questions specifically for this group of folks, um, you can definitely hold on to those and we'll address those at the end. But I do want to move on to our second group. Um, the second question for this group of individuals, Anita, Karen, and Paula. So I'm wondering, in your own professions, do you feel that people are well prepared to provide support for those who are struggling with eating disorders? And building off of that, do you have any changes or suggestions to offer? So Anita, I'd like to begin with your perspective as a clinical psychologist. Oh, I've been thinking about that one. That's uh, it's a tough one to answer. So uh, you know, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, from a from a psychologist position, I uh, no no, I don't I don't think that we as a field are well equipped to manage eating disorders. I uh, pretty much 100% of what I do at this point is, is training other professionals. And what I observe is lots of people are interested and most don't know even some of the fundamental uh, pieces about eating disorders. So, and which is kind of astounding. Like you think as a psychologist, we're in school for about a decade, you know, studying mental health and many don't really have much training in eating disorders. And so uh, I, I, I'm seeing the most interest in learning about eating disorders the last two years than I've ever seen in the last 25 in, in, from my perspective, which is, um, gives me a lot of hope. And even when I do some of my more advanced trainings, you know, in let's say DBT, people will come to those trainings and say, yeah, yeah, I, I understand eating disorders. And then they get in there and, and they realize 
They don't actually know the latest neurometabolic findings, or they don't really know about traumatic invalidation. Sure, I was really struck by when you, when you talked about the comments that you've received. I can only imagine over the course of your life how invalidating that is and, and what that does to the evolving picture. And you know, there's just so many people that don't really know. And, and then the other piece is we all know that eating disorders are not something that you can treat by yourself. So, you know, me as a psychologist treating eating disorders, I, I depend on my team, a team of physicians, psychiatrists, dietitians, uh, people with lived experience working together. And yet most, most psychologists aren't working in teams. And so there, there are these sort of pieces that, that we're challenged by. And the good news is I'm, I'm watching people come together and receive training in ways I've never seen so that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you. If when you said that so much of your work revolves around training, I think my face sort of was like, wow, that, that, that really, really shocked me. Um, so thank you for providing that really in-depth answer. And Karen, how about family physicians? Do you feel that they are well-equipped to provide support? And perhaps you can elaborate if not, or if so. Thanks, Chloe, and thanks for inviting me. So as a family doctor myself, I can definitely say that family docs do not know enough about eating disorders. And that certainly included me, you know, before my daughter got sick, um, I would have thought that there were just a few people in my family practice with e eating disorder. But after my daughter went through an eating disorder, I started to realize I was missing people left and right um, because I just didn't have the training. And unfortunately, this is still the case um, to this day in, in uh, at McMaster Medical School. Um, medical students are only getting about five hours of training in total throughout their entire medical training. And, uh, and also in family practice residencies, there's not much training about eating disorders. And this is really scary for family docs because they are aware that eating disorders are dangerous illnesses, and they feel totally unprepared to, to monitor uh, people with eating disorders, to diagnose them. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a small study on family doctors, what they want to learn about eating disorders. And what really struck me was the way the family doc said, we just don't know enough. And it really scares us because we know that we should be monitoring our patients with eating disorders. We should be getting help for them when they need it, but we literally don't know what to do. And another thing that they expressed was that sometimes when we have a one of our patients who's on a waiting list for treatment, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about waiting lists at some point, um, when a patient is on a waiting list for treatment, it's the family doctor who's supposed to be continuing to provide care. But these family docs uh, in the study were saying that, how are we supposed to do this? Because um, we don't know enough about it. And so um, I really feel that training, more training for family docs is so important. And I agree with Anita that in the last two years, there's been a lot more awareness about eating disorders. That's one, I guess, uh, silver lining to COVID. Um, there's been a lot more interest among family docs and, and awareness of the need for training. So I certainly think that that's such an important thing. One, one thing that's kind of exciting is that family docs are, are working more and more in teams uh, through family health teams and so on. So there are opportunities for family docs to work with dietitians, with therapists, with psychiatrists. And so I think this is a really exciting area where perhaps some progress could be made to develop those teams to understand more about how to um, provide wraparound care for people with eating disorders. I love that point. I feel like it segues ne really well next to Paula, um, who's working as a dietitian. I'm sure you oftentimes work alongside um, folks like Anita and Karen. So. How do you feel um, with your role? How well prepared are dietitians? Um, I have to echo both Anita and Karen in saying that dietitians as a general 
group of profession are not well prepared. Um, and it comes down to the education. In, when you're in school, you maybe get a couple of paragraphs about mental health in general um, and not too much really drilling down into learning more or understanding eating disorders. And once you're finished with the education piece and you go in and you're in more of a internship, so some dietitians have internship or um, training at hospitals and clinics and other sites like that, not every single dietitian will get eating disorder training because it's actually elective. You get to choose whether or not you wish to learn more about this. And that's a challenge because there's a lot of disordered eating, a lot of eating disorders that a dietitian will see throughout their career in different settings, not just in an eating disorder clinic. You will see um, people with disordered eating, eating disorders in a family health team, in a community health center, in an inpatient bed. And those dietitians are not well equipped. And I've, I've spoken to many dietitians. I've worked in um, hospital-based programs. I currently work part-time in a hospital-based program. A lot of dietitians will call us up asking us for advice in terms of help. In They have a patient in an inpatient bed. They're not sure how to manage. They will call us up. It's, it's heartening to hear that they can reach out, but I don't feel that enough people are reaching out. Um, and they also are lacking that knowledge and the and I don't know if the confidence is the right word, but the education and the knowledge to manage. Um, and, and that is very unfortunate um, that it's not covered enough at school. And many dietitians just do not feel prepared and are very wary to take on clients with disordered eating that present to them, either in their private practice or in a family health team type of setting. I'm hearing that there seems to be a lot of fear underlying even bringing up eating disorders. Um, and I wonder, Anita, Karen, is there anything else that you may want to, to jump on and add to Paula's points? Always. <laughs> um, it made me think about, um, you know, the, outside of the eating disorders world, you, you know, I think people, there are still, there's still so much stigma and misconception. I remember once being in a working in a hospital, and, and one of the one of the co clinicians sort of said to me, "Why do you why do you do this work? Like why?" And I said, "Because I don't know. I, I don't know for a million reasons. I mean, I can't answer that in the hallway." But you know, and they said, well, "But but people don't get better. You know, I, I couldn't do this work. It's too hard. Like it, I, I'll never forget that. I remember standing by the elevator and." And I, I still come up against that again, outside of those who are trained, but I think there's this pervasive sense that this is just, it's above what I do. I'm too uncomfortable. I don't have the training, but also misconceptions about recovery uh, or, or, you know, it's too slow. It's too hard. People don't get better. It reminds me of the way people would talk about borderline personality disorder back, you know, before Linehan, right? You know, it's treatment resistant. And I say, well, but it's not. But I think this, these are barriers that I'm starting to see, you know, we're dismantling. However, you know, I think these are the problems that we face, you know, how the world thinks of eating disorders. I really, really uh, acknowledge that too, Anita. There's, you know, very strange stigma associated with eating disorders so that health professionals feel that they're just way too complicated. And, uh, you know, I've had... Uh, clients at Body Brave saying to me, well, I went to a psychiatrist and he said to me, I don't do eating disorders. <laughs> what does that even mean? And, you know, even psychiatrists are not getting trained much about eating disorders. And it seems such a shame to me because I, I find generally people with eating disorders are, are such interesting people and, you know, generally very bright and 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 so worthy of treatment at the time that they need it. Um, so it's it's uh, I think it's a lot about breaking down stigma among health professionals as well, in addition to more training. Absolutely, Paula, was there any last thoughts? Um, I absolutely echo those thoughts. I often get the head nodding. So yeah, like <laughs> so that's a good sign. So many times I've been on by other dietitians. Wow, you work in eating disorders? That must be so difficult. And it's it's just there is a lot of stigma. There's a lot of preconceived notions about working 
in this field that need to come down and need to be dispelled um, in order to provide people with the care they need. Thank you for that. Um, we'll return to this group of in individuals later, but next I want to speak directly with Allison and Margaret for their perspectives. And my question for you two is, what actions can you take to break the silo around eating disorders and elevate this issue into being a provincial and national priority that's interconnected with health and social policy change? I know that's a big question. <laughs> Um, so, so I'll give you a chance to speak to that. Um, and Allison, perhaps you begin from a psychiatry perspective. Great, thanks so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today um, uh, and uh, to talk a little bit about this issue. Um, I, I just was before I talk a bit about silos, I, I just wanted to really acknowledge some of the comments around training uh, and just echo the importance of us thinking about how we ensure all generalists, and I consider myself a generalist psychiatrist, um, get the skills and experience to really be part of a system of care that helps uh, ensure um, people suffering from eating disorders uh, get, get the best outcomes they can. So in speaking about silos, maybe the first thing I would do is to recognize there are so many silos and um, I think there's silos both uh, in terms of how people work within individual clinical settings, there's silos uh, within regions, there's silos at a provincial level and silos nationally around this. Uh, and I think some of the actions that we could think about could be divided in that perspective. Um, one of the things I certainly see um, in practicing in this area is even in how we think about understanding what our patients' uh, needs are. And, and many people I end up getting to work with or meet, meet with, they come with an eating disorder, but they also um, come with other conditions or mental illnesses that need that kind of attention or care. So one of the silos just at the clinical level I believe is that we, we tend to sort of focus on one area and then tell people, I'm sorry, you're gonna to have to wait. You'll need to go somewhere else for some treatment to deal with your addiction or your mood disorder, your anxiety disorder, personality disorder, your psychosis, any of those things. And I see that as being really hard for, for some of the uh, folks that I, I've had the privilege of working with recently. I think the other silo really is from the EDI si uh, silo, um, really not understanding that sort of uh, importance of all of us as healthcare professionals operating with cultural humility, a willingness to learn different perspectives uh, and ensuring that we're not creating too much of a silo with um, a sort of stereotype version of what it should look like uh, to provide treatment and care for people. Um, working at a regional or provincial level, uh, I think again, uh, we, we do operate in silos and I think somebody earlier mentioned and it's been in the chat, the issue of waiting lists and so what I've seen is, is people waiting on three, four, five different waiting lists for different kinds of treatment, uh, and then being able to sort of access a treatment. Um, without that proper integration of, of waiting, waiting lists, access, ensuring people are connected to the right treatment the first time around, rather than perhaps seeing multiple different treatments to find that the right fit for themselves individually. So how do we do that better? How do we break down those silos waiting for treatment and care? I think that's really important. Um, then sort of at a provincial, provincial level, um, uh, the, the sort of silos around different uh, uh, places where people receive clinical care, whether that's in a hospital setting, which is where I work, uh, out in the community and private practices, wherever that may be, um, how, is a, how do we create a kind of a um, sort of regional or provincial system of care so that people can actually get the care they need at different stages in their journey? Um, and uh, not sort of arrive somewhere and that not know where else to go to get um, either sort of their uh, maintenance treatment and support to help maintain any successes or where somebody might need to go if they've had limited success in the program they're at. And it's been really great working in this area. A couple of the panelists here, and I'm just doing a big shout out for Karen, uh, who have had an opportunity to have some conversations with to really learn a little bit about what it's like uh, offering care, either in a community setting or in a hospital setting, and how can we be more effective together. Um, maybe the, the last couple of things I'll just uh, acknowledge is I'm hoping um, that there will be some improvements in this area of silos. In Ontario, where I practice, uh, there are provincial guidelines that are coming out shortly. Um, hopefully that's going to provide some guidance and standardization about how we do start working together, providing evidence-based treatment options to people that we believe will work, uh, and it's going to help us begin to coordinate better uh, for access. 
And then um, I just want to do a big shout out uh, for this group because this is really a great example at a national level about how to bring different perspectives, different providers, different experiences together to think about that continuum on a more national level and how we uh, ensure that anyone, wherever they live in Canada, um, who is experiencing these kinds of symptoms is getting early access to treatment, hopefully prevention uh, before they get the illness, but if they do treatment at that stage. Thank you, Alison. Yes, to your point about silos, when the in silos, I could not agree more there. And I think there also is a lot of hope when we look at these provincial standards of care that are coming out for eating disorder treatment. I know being part of that advisory committee was really exciting for someone with lived experience. Um, and so Margaret, you're, you're working more on the national level. Can you mm -hmm. talk about some of the silos that you see there and what actions in particular you and your organization are taking? Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm with the Canadian Mental Health Association. I'm in our national office in Toronto or Tuckeronto. And we work with our provincial divisions across 10 provinces in the Yukon Territory. And we have 69 branches across the, uh, the country. So we're in 330 communities delivering community mental health services. Um, and many of our branches uh, do uh, deliver eating disorder programs and services. And what I've heard across the country is that the waiting lists are huge and the numbers particularly for children and youth are growing. And we don't have the resources to actually serve everyone who comes to us. I was really touched to hear the comments from the family members and people with lived experience about the wait times and how long it takes to actually access care. And one of the things that I've started to think about with silos especially is um, the fact that it is more women than men who experience eating disorders. And I'm afraid that misogyny has placed us into silos on this issue, that women's pain and suffering and girls' pain and suffering is not treated as seriously as men's. And so I think one of the things we need to push back again is the, the right for all of us to experience good mental health and good physical health. So what we're doing at the National Office of CMHA is really calling for universal mental health care. We saw through the pandemic that there just was not appropriate funding for mental health of any kind. And so we've been asking the federal government, and I was hoping today, in fact, that I would come and bring some good news. Maybe it's kind of okay news, um, but the, the Prime Minister announced today that they would be increasing funding for mental health but they're increasing it through uh, bilateral agreements with provinces where provinces will get to pick and choose whether to fund mental health and to what extent based on action plans that they negotiate with the federal government. So we were hoping for something more like a mental health transfer where funds would be clearly ring fenced just for mental health that everybody, no matter what province you live, lived in or what territory could access mental health care. And that the services of psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, um, eating disorder programs, all of that would be free, that you would just show your health card and you would get access to free service. I mean, this is a, a huge issue in our country that we really don't have universal mental health care. Um, and yet when we ask for it, you know, we end up with kind of compromised bilateral programs, I'm afraid, that aren't going to guarantee free service for everybody. So we're going to keep working on it. We're going to be working with the provinces as well as they roll out these bilateral agreements, but we really see that um, we're going to develop a movement. We've started um, a campaign at a website, Act for Mental Health. We have 35 different national nonprofit associations, including the Canadian Psychiatrists, the Canadian Psychologists Association, the YMCA, all coming forward to say, we need this money and we need it now. So. Uh, We'll look for your support. And we thank Nyad as well and Lynn for, for her support for this campaign. Certainly lots of actions that came out of there. And I know before this discussion started, that was top of mind for a lot of us here was that announcement from the federal government. Um, Allison, did you have any quick thoughts on that as well? Uh, just I'm equally keen to hear how that's going to apply. Uh, certainly, um, as, as Margaret just said, you know, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, which I'm also connected with, uh, very eager to to um, uh, sort of put forward, you know, one of our key 
key values and principles, which is about access to care and access for everyone to care at wherever they need it. So looking forward to working with the organizations on that and really supporting at a from an eating disorders perspective, how can how can we um, uh, break down those silos and make sure that people are getting where they need to, to get to. And lots of great conversation in the chat. So I was a bit distracted by all the great comments coming through, uh, but really uh, thinking a lot about uh, the importance of the appropriate gendered approach and EDI approach as we think about building out some of those uh, those uh, services as well. Absolutely, I feel there's there's so many micro conversations happening here that we could honestly talk for hours and hours. So I, I thank you both for touching on those points, and we'll we'll come back to you later, and we can answer some of the questions more in the chat. Um, so because this is a solo, sorry solutions focused conversation. Um, I'm going to do a round table and I'm going to go back to all the panelists, um, beginning with the lived and living experience folks. And my question for you is what solutions or learnings are you seeing that you're really excited about? And I'll begin with Shira. Thank you so much, Chloe. And um, I think some of the things that I'm excited about, I actually heard echoed in these conversations. So I heard um, um, somebody bring up working in a team setting as a, psych uh, a psychologist. And I heard Allison bring up um, as well, the need to not just put people into these individual boxes and individual referrals to treat individual problems. Because um, my big answer to this is just, like seeing more of a holistic treatment. And by that, I mean taking into account all aspects of health, including psychiatric, physical comorbidities and taking into account spirituality and um, all these different factors. And I know in my experience, um, professionals are always trying to fit me into boxes based on my symptoms and send me off for different types of help. And in reality, it's a lot more messy and complicated than that. Um, the lines blur and symptoms overlap. Um, a lot of my psychosis symptoms and my eating disorder symptoms really bounce off each other. And I find that I get really stuck when that's happening because professionals don't know how to navigate that um, because they're either specialized in one area or the other. And when things start to overlap, they want me to go to a different professional. But something that's been really helpful for me in my recovery recently is I started a new type of therapy, um, schema therapy. And in this therapy, the therapist I'm working with is trying to help me with all of my issues combined with all of my mental health challenges and taking into account my background, taking into account um, my experiences with trauma and um, not just trying to focus on one problem um, or one challenge that I'm experiencing. And I think seeing more of um, these types of solutions where people are working as a team, um, my therapist is working with my psychiatrist and with my uh, case manager, with um, lots of different people on my team so that um, everyone is kind of in the know about um, how to uh, communicate and help me them the best way possible. Thank you. That must be so validating to have that holistic approach, especially given what you've shared about past approaches. So um, that, that's really wonderful to hear that you've found a therapy that seems to be really working. Um, and Dave, how about you? Is there a solution that really excites you about uh, helping folks with eating disorders? Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, as, as, a, as a dad uh, supporting my daughter, she, she's really hopeful with some of the, the things that she's seen happening, but not only for herself, but just in her in her every day. So there's more awareness now amongst her, her age group. And I think that these kinds of discussions are really important. And, and she's so brave to share her experience with others. So, you know, my hat goes off to you, Chloe, and Shira, if we're able to do that, because it inspires others to do so. And I think that you bring me hope because in sharing the story, 
we're, we're, we're breaking down those barriers, right? People aren't living in silence and, and they're, they're reaching out and, and, and we're building momentum. Um, from an education standpoint, I think there's work to be done in awareness, but now we're starting to see uh, school boards starting to come together and bringing eating disorder into their mental health um, focus and, and moving forward. So that's very positive. And then um, lastly, starting to see connections, at least it, where I am with, um, you know, hospitals and outpatients and care for, for students and, and just creating those conversations with schools and parents is so important. And we're starting to see some momentum build in there. So um, we're moving in the right direction. So I, I'm hopeful that we keep that going. And Paul, adding on to that, are you also hopeful about certain solutions as well? Yes, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm probably batting clean up here for Dave and Shira a little bit because I, I Shira, I'm just so um, impressed with your courage, your voice. I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna after this call get uh, back to my own daughter to talk a little bit about this conversation. Just uh, amazed and honored to join us. Um, I think the big part, and it's been echoed through this throughout the uh, this conversation, is the importance of of just engaging ourselves meaningfully uh, at the national and local level in these conversations. I mean, today is what really gives me optimism. This opportunity to to sit with this panel among people here today is such a big part of it, and it it's you know it's the the extent to which we we invest ourselves fully in listening. And I, and I don't mean that in any other context um, than what it is, is the better we are at finding a place. I think this is one of the, my big learnings as a dad is, is how to get better at listening and how, uh, how much I need to continue to do that. And I would, I would apply that. Um, I would apply that to what it feels like at the dinner table, to the conversations that we're having locally and even nationally. Do we want to invest ourselves, continue to invest ourselves on in being in the room and listening to ourselves widely and having the courage to, to, to act? So for me, a big part of this is uh, humbly adding my voice and my, my, my listening to whatever I can contribute in small ways or big to that. So that's what's been inspiring for me. That's wonderful. I like what you said about the listening piece. Um, I think sometimes for individuals with eating disorders, it really does feel like you're invisible. And so having anyone just hear you and really empathize and sit with you in that, that pain or the challenges that you're going through is so important. Um, so now I'll ask the same question to our next group with um, Anita, Karen, and Paula. And so same question, I'm wondering what solutions or learnings are you seeing that you're really excited about? Um, so I'll start here with Anita. I have a list. <laughs> Love it. Um, and this is so important because we're at a time where people are feeling pretty hopeless and pretty stuck. And there's a lot of, a lot going on. And, and I want to remind people that that is happening and there are these other pieces happening. So for example, uh, when I talk about the trainings that, that I get to do, not only am I seeing hundreds and hundreds of people every year from around the world, which is excellent. It means there's more people interested in wanting to do this. And it's not just in that sort of idea of if I can just, I think Shira, again, you said this, like it's, you can't just take the eating disorder out of who the person is. You know, diverse, diversity, neurodiversity, trauma, bio temperament. You, know, you have to think about who this person is and I'm seeing a shift in thinking about the eating disorder more broadly in our more, you know, in our OHIP covered programs, for example. So instead of just seeing the eating disorder like this laser focus, let's just focus on weight and eating and nutrition. Yes, of course that's important. And what are we doing about trauma and emotion regulation and self-regulation and identity and, and all the ways that people have been marginalized and discriminated. Like, like I'm seeing that happening. Uh, which is moving away from this one size fits all. Uh, I'm really a proponent of different care pathways. Uh, and I understand that's a funding issue, it's a systems issue, but really that's where we need to evolve. Um, 
acknowledgement. I'm having some really hard conversations with my peers and my colleagues, really hard conversations about the ways in which we have been harmful and we have been invalidating to uh, people with eating disorders, um, people with atypical anorexia, using BMI as the sole focus on whether you're severe or enough. What I like about this is that this is the first time in all of my career that I've been able to sit with my peers and have these conversations at the provincial level and, and that people are hearing it and wanting to do better. And that gives that, I literally get goosebumps when I get to sit with people and have those conversations that is hopeful for me and lived experiences being welcome. I academically grew up at a time where if you disclosed that you had an eating disorder, that was the end of your career in the eating disorders field. And without getting too emotional, I got to tell you that this whole piece tonight and the people that I get to work with who aren't afraid to say I'm a professional and I have lived experience not only makes me happy, but it's just exactly what our field needs, that we're not pathologizing people because they've had lived experience, that we've created space for people to exist and, and work together is, is probably the highlight of my career. So that's all I'm going to say for tonight, but thank you. Thanks for sharing part of that list with us. Um, Karen, I'll look to you for what excites you on the solution side. Yeah, lots of things um, I think are exciting. Um, we're seeing around the world pr some pretty in innovative and exciting new models for care for eating disorders. So thinking of Australia, where they've rolled out a really extensive community-based treatment approach, because um, as everyone knows, there's this big gap between when a person first develops symptoms and then when they eventually end up at hospital-based care. And there's this huge gap. And what, what we really need is a robust form of stepped care so that people are able to get basic support right away as soon as they realize that something's wrong. And then to slowly step up to the, the next step being community-based care. And then after that, outpatient care and only getting into inpatient when absolutely necessary. And we're seeing this uh, in exciting ways in many countries around the world. I think we still have a lot of work to do in Canada. There's still not a lot of community-based supports for people with eating disorders. Um, another thing that I think is exciting, we're starting to see the conversation about eating disorders coming into different spaces. And I'm thinking here, as I've mentioned, about family health teams. Right now, we're working with the McMaster Family Health Team and another big family health team in Hamilton about training their dietitians, their therapists, and their family doctors to work as multidisciplinary teams. And I think that's something exciting. And I've often found that when people start learning about eating disorders, they get really enthusiastic because it's such an interesting area. Um, and then also bringing eating disorder uh, conversations and care into community programs like youth wellness hubs, for example. So I just think there's so many places that um, eating disorder awareness and basic levels of treatment can come into being, not just in hospital-based care. And then, of course, I, I also think this whole issue around the silos, you know, trying to build those bridges of communication between family doctors and people working in the eating disorder field, between family docs and psychiatrists who are specialized in the field. The more we can break down the silos, the better. And I just really want to congratulate um, Need for organizing this along with NEDIC and all the other organizations, because this is the kind of thing that I think is so important to help break down silos and expand the conversation. So I do see a lot of very- I'm so sorry to cut you off. I just want to ensure we have enough time for questions at the end, Karen. All wonderful points. Um, Paula, may I ask you to jump in here? Yeah, I'm going to keep it short. Um, Karen stole a little bit of my thunder in Durham, where I work um, in our eating disorder program there. We are having also, like Karen says, 
partnerships with FHDs, family health teams, and I feel like that's very refreshing. And it, we have patients that are sitting on our wait list. They're being cared by family health teams and being able to support the family health team to care for these patients while they're waiting for services is really an important piece of the puzzle. It's absolutely not a solution. And it's absolutely something that's more a symptom than a solution, um, but it is something that we need right now in order to help support people. Um, and my second point is I very echoing what Anita says, having difficult conversations is really exciting to me. Um, having difficult conversations about things like fat phobia in clinicians and in healthcare, how is that affecting what the care that we provide? Um, so those are things I find exciting. Yeah, so certainly touching on a lot of really difficult things. And um, I can see in the chat too, lots of these points are really resonating. Uh, Margaret, I'll turn to you about um, what gives you hope and excitement. Thanks so much. Um, I want to thank the commentators. Um, it, this has been wonderful to see everyone's comments. And uh, thank you for your thoughtful comments around uh, my thoughts around misogyny. So I do appreciate what I'm learning in the chat. Um, I think what gives me hope is events like this where we are coming together and celebrating the wins that we've experienced. Um, it can be hard to work in this field and I feel like we, we can be siloed and isolated. And so hearing people speak about what works, hearing people speak about the hope that their program or their, uh, their work has given them, I find really inspiring and makes me think that uh, more is possible. If we've gone from a time when people couldn't reveal their eating disorder for fear of being shunned within their work, then we've made tremendous progress um, as a sector in moving these issues forward. So I think, you know, things like this help us reduce stigma. They help us remember that there is good work that's happening and that success is possible. So uh, thanks for everybody for your thoughts today. It certainly is inspiring. And Alison, last but not least, um, what excites you here? Uh, this, just like everyone else, this is very exciting. Um, a great opportunity to learn. I want to double click on uh, the comment about step care. I do think that's a great opportunity and the Mental Health Commission has been doing some work about how to advance that more broadly. So perhaps this is an opportunity to figure out some of these processes as it relates to eating disorders. Um, and and I, think, I think the other thing that's exciting is the, is the opportunity to listen. Um, you know, the, the medical model of, of care for many things, and I will include eating disorders of that, is that when somebody goes through treatment and it doesn't work so well for that person, we have a bit of a tendency to say the patient failed the treatment, which is such a terrible thing to say. And I, I think this is the sort of advocacy where we need to turn things around and say, the treatment failed the patient. What can we do next? And Shira, I just want to say thank you for everything you've said. And I've written down schema therapy and I'm gonna go home and research about that after because that's how we can learn about what can we offer next to people where traditional ways of doing things is not working as well. And we need to seek options for people. Brilliant. Thank you, Alison. Um, so we, we have been getting lots of questions and um, one of them that I want to address right now, we're just going to switch gears a little bit and I'll read one of the questions and whoever would like to um, answer, feel free to just put your hand up or use that um, hand function. So the first question from the audience is how can we change the training landscape across professions? Are there strategies that have been effective with putting issues like this on the rate? radar, um, specifically fat phobia, intersections with gender, um, and raising those alongside eating disorders. So the question is more geared around the training landscape and how that is shifting. Anyone, Anita, I'm looking at you just because you've done so much <laughs> training. <laughs> um, I guess I would, I mean, it's happening. I think that it has to come from systems. Like it, it needs to be well supported. It needs to be well funded. Um, you know, like I'm thinking about what I've seen here in Ontario and the reason that it's been as, as good as I think it is, is because Eating Disorders Ontario is funding it. And they've put a lot, so what that does is it brings all the provincial programs together. I've never seen the provincial programs come together the way I've seen them come together in this last couple of years. We were all, even within our system, we were always siloed, even as different eating disorder programs. We never, now there's this collective sharing of resources and, 
and things. So, but that has had to come from the, from, from a bigger system. So training, I think to really trans, transform the training landscape, we need to be applying for funding, not just for immediate training. Cause I always tell teams, I can come in for a, for two days or a week and we can get all excited about something, but that's not the same as implementation. It, like teams really need the support to not, to, to learn how to do something, but then support in, in implementing that, that particular treatment that they're trying to do. And so I've been working with teams to, to look at their funding applications and how to do this in a way that's more sustainable. Uh, but it, these are big projects that, you know, to, to redesign the way we treat eating disorders. Sometimes I say to people, it's like turning the, trying to turn the Titanic, you know, like it's, it, 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 it takes a lot of effort, a lot of funding, it's happening. And we need a lot of system support. We need a lot more money. And we got to work together. There's no doubt about it. Alison, do you have anything you want to add on to that? Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. One is the, I think there is an opportunity. So where people are involved in any sort of uh, undergraduate training programs for health profession students, how can we advocate for either formal curricular advancement in this area, or if there are case studies in a more general area, bringing in a, a, a case study which involves eating disorders part of the case. I think um, that, you know there are some informal ways to continue to build uh, interest early on so people will seek out training. And then the other part is uh, when we talk about um, uh, uh, training, it really should be uh, just to, to copy what Anita was saying that team-based care. Often we learn in silos, so doctors go and learn together and uh, psychiatrists go and learn together and nurses go and learn together. So how do we really make sure if you're not already in a team that we help put people into team-based learning? Because it's not just about becoming an expert, it really is about how to function effectively with different team members who have different scopes of practice to really optimize what we can do for treatment. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, did anyone else want to just add one last thought before I move on to the next question here? Um, so this question is around accessibility. And the question is, do we have any ideas on how to bring accessible and competent eating disorder care to rural and remote communities like those existing in the Northern Territories, especially pertaining to the prevalence of sky high prices of food and rotten food being sold in store? Um, Karen, I believe you had some experience working in these sort of areas. Did you, did you wanna start with answering this question? I'm um, sure. So it's it's such an important question because for people in remote and rural areas, access is even more difficult than for a people people in uh, in more urban areas. Um, one of the things I think is 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 exciting is virtual care and how that is really taking off. And uh, since at Body Brave, since we went virtual after COVID hit. We started getting people reaching out to us from all over the province, and um, we realized that, you know, in the way we were working, we were we just weren't providing any uh, support or access for people in remote and rural areas. So I do think there's quite a lot of potential for online and virtual kinds of care that that would be helpful for people to get help at the time that they need it. Thanks for that. And I think it's it's timely that we're asking about the the high prices of food. You know, there this is a very real crisis for many folks. Um, were there anyone else that wanted to elaborate a little bit more on this question? I'm seeing in the chat. Yes, the virtual health has blossomed. That's something that certainly did not exist two years ago. Um, Can I just quickly, maybe the other thing I would add is that because even if you're in remote areas, there are many people we work with that, that don't have access even to virtual, they don't even have, they don't even have internet connections, they have poor internet connections. And we've had some success in helping them obtain greater government funding, like the disability tax credits or other things that has taken me quite a bit to, to argue with the government with, but now I've got a sort of way that, but I think there's ways of leveraging, it's not perfect, I don't like that it's like this, but I think there's ways of leveraging the system to, to recognize that people with eating disorders actually meet those criteria for disability. Um, and, and I get very frustrated, as you can tell, by, by the quick denial that our patients get or clients. And so I, that's another way that I've been able to help get even money for people to get a computer, right? So that they can then access Body Brave, right? Like 
but it's it's or they don't even have the the child care like in some of the first nation indigenous like there's they can't even even if it's virtual they can't they it, there's so many psychosocial stressors that i think that's the way i've been able to get further with government funding but it's really learning to speak a language that i i didn't get in grad school Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to move on to our last question and again has to do with training, um, but I think this is really important is the question is how can we meaningfully involve people with lived experience who are not professionals in the development of this training. Um, what is the potential for peer support in this space. Shira go for it. Yeah, so um, as someone with. Uh, living experience and who's also pursuing a degree in the mental health profession. Um, I really think that that's an important, um, that's really crucial that we involve people with lived and living experience in these conversations and especially those who, um, not just those who have like additional training, but um, that's a really great resource. Um, and I think part of that is making it more of a safe space to be able to share that you do have lived and living experience. Um, as Anita was saying earlier, um, it's not always uh, so easy to share and it's um, not always so well accepted. And um, so I think it's really important that we take the we take the lead from people with lived experience and living experience when we're making these trainings and when we're um, working towards taking these steps to better care. Beautifully said, thank you. Dave, I see your hand raised as well. Just, just to add to that, um, I think it's important too for, you know, treatment, facilities and people who are, are doing the treatment in teams that, you know, there's ongoing research. And part of that research is reaching out to the families or the people, uh, caregivers to, to hear their voice. And that goes back to what Paul was saying, because I think there's a lot of important data and information that can really guide decision making around what that training is going to look like and next steps to support uh, families and, and uh, people who don't have families, people, you know, all sorts of individuals who go through that, but to really have mechanisms in place so people who are going through these things have an opportunity to share. Absolutely. Paul, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I just, I mean, I think um, it's, it's, you know, been stated, but I'll just maybe leap off a little bit on Dave's comments. Um, you know, and again, I keep hearkening back to our, our experience and how fortunate we were to not just as a family kind of um, work through this and talk through this and, and um, navigate it um, in what seemed somewhat times like chaos, um, but, but for those practitioners around us to be, a, to be a place for us as well and to hold space for us as well. So I just think that the extent to which we continue to try to create the, the I guess the safety around these conversations um, and and create more uh, venues for it are, are important. And certainly that would be a commitment that I'm you know, gonna continue to try to invest in myself, but it's it's just so important that um, we we are able to provide uh, salient feedback to our to our medical practitioners about that, that lived experience and um, and giving them those those opportunities to pose the questions that they have of us as well. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, so there's a question here. I'm going to aim it more towards um, Allison and Margaret. Um, so there seems to be a policy window here with regards to influencing how the province will allocate the new federal funding. And so the question is regarding how can professionals, families, and people with lived experience mobilize together to influence this? Um, Margaret, you're nodding, and I'll, I'll let you begin first, if that's all right. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. It'll it'll all go back to the provinces now. And so we've been encouraging local CMHAs, our branches and divisions, to write letters to their premiers and to their ministers of health 
uh, and if you have one, a Minister of Mental Health, uh, to ask them for increased funding for your programs and services. So it's really important that people hear your voice. You know, one thing that we always say is governments don't lead, um, they follow. They follow who pesters them the most. <laughs> so I would encourage you to pester your provincial government. Um, they have a couple of options about how they're going to spend that money when it rolls out. They could spend on mental health. They could spend on long-term care. So they're really going to be developing their own action plan for each province. I know a lot of those ministers and premiers have been hearing about mental health concerns within their provinces, um, but this is really the time to step it up to say that you absolutely need more access, especially if you're concerned about uh, the north uh, and rural areas, remote uh, service is a huge issue in our country. Um, and there is a, an approach from um, uh, government that they think that um, virtual services answer all the questions, but we know that not everybody has equipment, not everybody has access to the internet, and we know that that's not appropriate care for everyone. So this is really the time to rally uh, at a provincial level. Thanks for that. Alison, did you have anything to add there? I just very much agree with uh, Margaret. I mean, the, the most important thing is to speak up, write those letters, um, and check in your provinces if there's any, in addition to the, the government, are there any other places where uh, raising a voice will be important? So, for example, Ontario, where we now have the Centre of Excellence, which is uh, uh, the division within Ontario Health that's very focused on um, advancing mental health and addictions treatment and care and actually has an entire stream of work around eating disorders with a provincial lead. I would also suggest lobbying them with uh, letters and asking for their voice towards this as well. And there's, there's probably equivalent things happening in other provinces. Great suggestions there. I have one last question for all the panelists and it's gonna be a very uh, quick round. You only need to give a short sentence or one word response, but I, I wanna know what the one action that you're going to be taking away from the result as a result of our conversation here today. Um, so I'll just go across on my screen and who I see. So Shira, I'll begin with you. One action. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of talking and sharing over the past few years, and I really wanna get more involved in my local community and um, taking action there. Amazing, thank you. And Dave, how about you? Yeah, I feel really um, rejuvenated after our conversation tonight, and um, you know it's good to know that I'm not alone in 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 the efforts that we're we're all united in, in making change, and that's uh, rekindled my my advocacy, if you will. So I'll, I'll keep moving forward and 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 uh, pressing for change. And Allison, how about yourself? I'm going to go back and, and uh, work to increase the number of health profession students that do a rotation through our eating disorders program at hospital. Amazing. Anita, is there one action for you? I have a list, but uh, I guess I'll okay. say that one of the things that's standing out for me is how I can better integrate people's experience, lived experience with my trainings. I try to do that and it's been hard because you have to, you know, confidentiality, but I, I'm, I'm very curious about collaborating and figuring out how to do that differently. Yeah. And Karen, how about yourself? Yeah, I think the theme of collaborating, you know, how do we collaborate more with other organizations, with the hospital programs, just uh, really working on breaking down those silos. And Margaret? I've made a note that I'm going to call Lynn and uh, follow up on the conversation. People have suggested in the chat that idea of a shared letter. Um, so would love to work with um, your association and ours to uh, combine our, our thoughts on, um, on what are key advocacy messages to make sure that um, we see some funding flow for eating disorders. That's incredible. That's great that that's just come out of this hour or so that we spent together. Um, and Paula? I'd like to go back to the dietitian programs that we've come from and ask for them to do more education in helping future dietitians learn more about eating disorders. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, 
So, wow, there's, I, I don't know if you could tell, but I was taking a lot of notes as we've been speaking. Um, and I also wanted to pose this question to the audience. I can see some folks in the chat are, you know, making note of some of the actions that they want to take away from today. There seems to be a lot of interest in letter writing. Um, I'm a communications professional, so I also am very much for that and, you know, getting our, our voices heard. But from what I've heard today, there has definitely been some themes that have emerged from the panelists discussion. I think in the next few years, it really looks like systemic change where we're turning this whole system upside down because clearly things are not working. We need to take a more holistic approach, uh, focusing on the person first. And also, um, I feel like we need to be a bit more creative in our approaches, whether that's looking at um, techniques like harm reduction and realizing that a full recovery isn't something that everyone can achieve. Um, when it comes to helping professionals feel more prepared, training was a word that we heard over and over again, but also bringing in the voices of those um, people with lived and living experience, breaking down stylos, silos rather, and part of that begins with not being scared to talk about eating disorders. Um, you know, we can't ignore that this issue doesn't exist. It does exist, and I think being here today has really amplified our voices and I think a lot of, like a lot of other folks in this space, the Eating Disorder Awareness Week can be very draining. So it's great to have some of that energy um, rejuvenated. And I think collaboration, again, is just something that keeps coming up over and over again, as well as addressing an aspect of humility where, yes, um, fat phobia in healthcare, the harm of healthcare, um, how BIPOC individuals are not getting the same access to care as people like myself are getting. These are all things that are really going to reshape um, how eating disorders looks like, not even the next one, three, five years. I'm thinking the next few weeks, the next few months. So it's, it's very clear that we're a very passionate, motivated group. Um, and I think, you know, hope and energy and optimism, they are needed when you're talking about a life-threatening illness. One action I'll be taking for today, I, I definitely will be thinking a lot. I need to read over all these notes and let things sink in, but I want to continue this conversation, whether it's through my own platforms on my blog or social media, and I really encourage us to just connect with each other. So if you want to share any information in the chat and, you know, build those networks with other people that are here. I know Eating Disorders Awareness Week is ending, but I really do feel like the actions are just getting started and that the momentum isn't slowing down anytime soon. So a huge thank you to everyone and I'll, I'll pass it on to Ari um, for some closing remarks. Hi everyone. Um, just wanna thank Chloe and the panelists. Um, I wanna let everybody know that this recording will hopefully be up tomorrow. I'll send out a post uh, panel recording email um, so that folks have this. Um, and I really want to thank the folks um, who helped organize this. Um, EDA is something that is a volunteer week that's organized. Um, there unfortunately isn't ever really funding for EDA so far and despite a lot of advocacy for it. And so I want to thank our community-based eating disorder agencies across the country that volunteered their time this year. Special shout out to committee members Lynn from Need, um, Shaylee and Sally from Vivid, Vancouver Island Voices for Eating Disorders, and Marissa from BANA, the Bulimia Anorexia and Nervosa Association, in organizing the panel, alongside the support of Body Brave, Eating Disorders Nova Scotia, the Eating Disorders Support Network of Alberta, Jesse's Legacy, Sheena's Place, and the Waterloo Wellington Eating Disorder Coalition um, for all of the work that went into it. Um, the committee is full of people who have living and lived experience of eating disorders and folks working together across these organizations to create change. And so I'm excited to see that there will hopefully be some follow-ups on this. There is a Google form with events, um, with, events, <laughs> with um, feedback in case folks would like to share. I'll make sure to include it in the follow-up email um, there too. So please don't hesitate to send your feedback to us there. Um, and I will ask all of our panelists and Chloe to wave goodbye as folks sign out for the day um, and I'll hit stop recording. So <laughs> thanks everybody. <laughs>